This is Gabrielle Bossy with Rob Baker of The Tragically Hip. How are you? I'm good. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. So I guess first, could you talk a little bit about how you got into music in the first place? Me personally, I uh, always loved it. I had an older sister who had uh, great taste in music. She had the Woodstock album and she liked Chicago and Sly and the Family Stone and Bob Dylan at about age five, I discovered Bob Dylan. I would just lay in the living room all day long and listen to Dylan, put on Sly and the Family Stone or whatever. Yeah, I was way into music from an early age. And I jumped around and played tennis racket to Led Zeppelin Records and David Bowie and Alice Cooper. And then when I was about 12, I discovered the Stones and I just decided I had to learn how to play. And I had a friend who uh, had a guitar that he sold me for $30, and it was almost unplayable. After a year of trying to play it, my dad bought me a real guitar, which I still have upstairs. Yeah, I recorded a few songs on that, Boots or Hearts, and various songs I recorded on that guitar that he bought me when I was 12 or 13. Uh, and I convinced my mother to get me... Well, uh, my mother got me an amp. My dad got me an electric guitar when I was 13. And I convinced Gord Sinclair to get... He lived across the street from me, and I convinced him to work on his parents to get him a bass. Yeah, and this is here in Kingston? Yeah, yeah, well, only a few blocks from here. So when we were about 13 years old, we started jamming together and looking for drummers and other people to jam with. And played uh, high school dances and uh, public school dances, sweet 16 parties, anything we could, you know, any gig we could get, any opportunity to play. Were there any Canadian bands that really influenced you at that age? I know we're talking Dylan and the Stones. And yeah, sure. One of the first concerts I saw, uh, Santana and Peter Frampton was the warm-up band. But one of the very first ones I saw was uh, Rush nice. with the original drummer, John Rutsey. Oh, cool. So they're touring their first album. And uh, the opening band was Foot in Cold Water. I don't know if you remember them. They had a couple of really big hits, Make Me Do Anything You Want. Great song. Yeah, they had a few big hits. And uh, April Wine was another band we used to see, and Heart would come through. Did you feel like you had ownership over Canadian bands, I guess? Or did you re relate to the fact that they were Canadian? For the most part, no. I don't think I did. You know, you would always proudly proclaim someone as Canadian, but it always seemed like they lived in the States and worked in the States. Rush was a little different, and Lighthouse was a little different. You know, Lighthouse always seemed like the better Canadian version of Chicago. Yeah, you were proud to uh, proclaim bands as Canadian, but uh, I wasn't so aware of maybe a, a real sense of them being Canadian. There was a great... Uh, <laughs> this is going way back, but... One of the pop companies, I think it was 7-Up for sure. I don't know who the parent company of 7-Up is, probably Coca-Cola. Uh, they had a competition where in the bottom of cans, they had pictures of musicians from different bands. Oh, yeah. And you'd collect the whole set. And if you collected the Stampeders, you got something. And if you collected uh, Ian and Sylvia, you got something. But if you collected Lighthouse, I think you won a car. <laughs> it was big because <laughs> awesome. there were a lot of members. So we talked about Gord Sinclair and how you kind of hooked up with him. How about the other guys? Where did the hip really take yeah, shape? Gord and I were playing in a high school band three blocks uh, down the road here. We'd play high school dances. We were called Rick and the Rodents. Yeah, playing The Clash and The Sex Pistols and The Who and The Stones. And there was another band in the high school called The Slinks. They had a really good front man, Gord Downey. And we thought, we're a really good band, but we don't have a good front man. <laughs> uh, we got to get that guy in our band. And then after high school, uh, I got into a band with Gord Downey and some other guys. And we played around town for a couple of years until we became sort of the uh, one of the hot bands, I guess, in eastern Ontario. We were trying to go to university at the time, and we were playing three, four nights a week. It was getting increasingly difficult to stay in school. So we pulled out of that band and said, let's just form a band with our friends at university and just play for beer and fun. And that's what we did. That was the Tragically Hip. So I guess, when did it take you beyond Kingston with the Tragically Hip? I mean, eventually it became more than just... Yeah, I think uh, with the Hip, we played around town for maybe a year, year and a half. And I was doing the booking in the beginning, and it was a very simple equation. I didn't like lifting gear, so I didn't want to play too many <laughs> gigs. We didn't have any roadies or people working for us, so it was kind of up to us. So it was we each had to make $50 and all the beer we could drink and no expenses. 
So PA and lights had to be covered. We got beer and we each got 50 bucks, which is a lot more in bands to make now, I think. That's a steep price. Anyways, we got lots of gigs and we were become, becoming a pretty good live band, I guess, and uh, writing songs. So I started getting us gigs at the Horseshoe. Yeah, we just sort of venture slowly creeping out of Kingston, you know, Belleville, Brockville, and then it was Cornwall and try and get a gig in Peterborough. And after a while, we kind of played every place in Kingston we could play. And we were in university and we thought, well, what place is like Kingston? London's like Kingston, you know, big university town. And it's sort of a, I guess you'd call a secondary market as opposed to Toronto. And uh, we always thought it was important to play those markets or those places instead of concentrating on the, the big city. So we started calling London our home away from home. We had friends going to Western, Don Charles Street, a place we called Charles Mansion. It's since burned down. Yeah, we'd all sleep on the floor and couches, and we'd play the spoke or call the office and Wonderland Gardens a few times. When did you have that moment where, okay, we're becoming... A big deal. We've been uh, discovered. I probably had that this summer. This summer. <laughs> <laughs> I've, it's always been kind of just to put one, one foot in front of the other. You don't think too much about where where you're headed or where you've been. It's always just sort of what's next. You know, there were there were nice moments along the way. It's nice to hear yourself on the radio. And uh, When Road Apples came out, there was a big mural painted in downtown Toronto on the side of a building. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. But it, it seems kind of divorced from yourself. You're just looking at something that's kind of neat, but you don't necessarily see yourself in it. What's a few of the other big highlights or uh, memorable shows? If you yeah, have? lots of memorable shows. One for sure was uh, opening for the Rolling Stones in Cologne, Germany, in a stadium full of 80,000 people. None of them really knew who we were. They didn't like us <laughs> <laughs> when we came on. You know, we weren't the Stones. You know, I, I saw the Clash get booed off the stage warming up for the Who, you know. They're getting impatient, and it was starting to rain. The rain was coming down. The drops were the size of toonies, and they were just <laughs> like you could really feel them hitting. Over the course of our half hour or 40 minutes, whatever we had, we kind of turned the audience around and they got in our corner and we just kind of put our heads down and plowed through and people started cheering and looked over and Mick Jagger was watching side stage. Oh, that's that got to be awesome. It was pretty cool. Nice moment. Well, how about uh, Canadian shows that are memorable? Yeah, there are. This summer uh, was all memorable. Yeah, I don't know. There there have been crazy shows. The, you know, the Shady Lady Disco Lounge in Renfrew and... <laughs> You know, lots of those strange. We did six nights at the Commodore back in uh, maybe 1989. Our first tour across the country, we, uh, we played uh, six nights in Dartmouth and then six nights in Halifax. So that's a big spread. Like that's yeah, it a, is. And yeah. we played in a in a Mexican restaurant in Halifax. <laughs> you know, we didn't have any money between us. We we pooled all our money on about day three and we didn't have enough money to buy a can of coke so we were living on coffee and free pop and nacho chip in the restaurant which they provided and then we uh, caught our sound man doing rails off his bedside table so you know that's the <laughs> rock and roll life i guess absolutely yeah, there you go found out where all the money was going do you think there's such thing as a canadian sound i've been asked that a lot and it's it's a tough one i always thought that if there was a Canadian sound, it was the kind of a troubadour, the people that walk on stage, and they're the same people on stage that they are off stage. And I always kind of got that sense from, uh, you know, whether it was Neil Young or Joni Mitchell, or they kind of set the tone for that, I thought. And then there was this whole period that I think we kind of reacted against in the 80s, where there were all these bands that seemed really desperate to make it in the States. It was about costume, gearing your songs towards a mass market or something. And we really reacted against that. We just thought, no, you sing about what you know about, and you just try and be yourself. So the Canadian sound to you would be more of an authenticity, I would argue. That it's something, yeah, something real genuine as opposed to a manufactured or a geared towards something the hip sings about so many canadian things it's no secret lots of canadian places all across the country was that a conscious decision like was there a time when you guys sat down and said we are going to be about canada no i don't think i don't think that was ever a conscious decision 
Um, maybe it was for Gord at some point, but I think originally it was just a very organic thing, trying to write about what you know about. Can you talk a little bit about the writing process for the tragedy Yep. Yeah, uh, there's no formula for writing songs. In the very early days of the band, Gord Sinclair would write almost all the songs, music and lyrics. Certainly for the Baby Blue album, he wrote five of eight songs, or, and he was a pretty complete songwriter. And Paul is also a very complete songwriter. He can come in with music and lyrics, and Gord has developed into that as well. But uh, shortly after Up to Here, uh, we had a little sit-down meeting and said... From this point on, all songs will be written by the Tragically Hip. And it doesn't matter who wrote the song, because we just wanted to eliminate the the arguments over, well, I wrote the bridge, or I contributed something there, or uh, your song got picked as the single last time, and, you know, someone's, someone's song becomes a hit, and they're driving around in a Mercedes, and everyone else is taking the bus. These are the things that kill bands. And we thought, if we're going to survive, if we're going to do anything in terms of a career, we're going to have to last. We're going to have to survive. So eliminate those problems right away. And for Gord Sinclair, I think it was a big thing because he was giving up. He was the natural songwriter. Shifting gears a little, I think especially this summer, but all of us, always, you've been referred to as Canada's band or our band. Why do you think they tragically hip over other bands for that? In part because we lasted. I think because... Uh, but there are a bunch of things, I guess, that we're all friends. That You know, we all went to the same high school and all old chums to, just did this for fun, really, and something happened. We made a career of it. I think the idea that we're big in Canada but never caught on south of the border feeds into it. I don't think it's entirely true. I don't either. We can tour around the States for months on end and play to 1,500 people a night. And, you know, 99.9% of U.S. bands would be thrilled to have the career that we have in the U.S. So, yeah, we're not playing big arenas in most U.S. cities, but we have very, a very very decent career down there. Do you think there's a reason why Canada's kind of held on to that rumor? Because you go into Yeah, because any- it fits the story better. It does, it makes, yeah. It makes for a better story. I kind of think it says something about Canadians. Uh, well, and... Uh, you know, when you live next door to the elephant, you want to have something that's your own. And every country nurtures their own. What's up for you now? I know you've got a few projects in the burner. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I have an application in at Metro as a bag boy. <laughs> and uh, I may do some male nude modeling for art classes. Other than that, I've been painting and I've been working in my home studio, plugging away at songwriting. I, you know, I guess with painting and my songwriting in the studio, I'm I'm making things for nobody that nobody wants, <laughs> but, but uh, find incredible satisfaction doing it, just chasing an idea down, whether it's musically or visually. So I will continue to do that. Maybe one day I'll break even on that stuff. Whatever, I, I've had a great career with the hip. I'm sure there will be other things, but I don't think there will be any more touring. So, you know, there's a lot of music in the can already. You know, every record we've done, we would go into the studio with 17 songs. And then uh, after about a week, we'd whittle two away. And then in the last week, we'd usually whittle another two away. So for most of those albums, they're an extra two, four, five songs. So maybe somewhere down the line that comes out, I don't know. And there was stuff that we were working on after Gord became sick. We spent some time at his place in Toronto and just hammered away at some tunes that were sort of half done. Yeah, there's lots of stuff in the can. Well, I'm sure hearing that would make a lot of fans very happy. So, yeah. excellent. How have you seen the hip change over these? I mean, you've been together a long time. Has it changed? Yeah, it definitely has changed, but it's a, uh, uh, we've never been a band for a makeover. You know, I know some bands. You know, U2 was always seemed to be big on that, the makeover, and uh, come back as something different. I never really got that, but they did okay with it. For us, it, as I said, it was just putting one foot in front of the other. And uh, and when you look back, you, you can see how far we came, just putting one foot in front of the other. You know, we started with very small ambitions. We wanted to be able to get gigs in bars and uh, get free beer and each make 50 bucks. And to do that, we thought, well, the best way was to emulate the sort of early English 
club scene. So, you know, the Yardbirds, Pretty Things, The Stones, all those bands that we loved. And then you start writing your own songs and you're looking at other influences. And then you're thinking about not repeating what you've done. And I think we've been pretty good about that. I, I think our music has continued to evolve and change. I think it always sounds like the hit. I don't think it ever got stuck in one thing. And I remember Bob Rock saying something in the studio. He would say to us, okay, play this song as if you're Fleetwood Mac. And we would say, well, why would we do that? We don't want to sound like Fleetwood Mac. Or he'd say, play this song like you're a, a wall of voodoo or or The Clash. Approach this one like The Clash. He'd say, well, that's great. We love The Clash, but How do you it, do that? we can't imitate The Clash. And he said, go ahead, imitate The Clash. It will sound like the tragically hip, that's even true. if you do. <laughs> no matter what you do, it's going to sound like you guys. And uh, I think he was right. So, Some fun questions to kind of end off on. Um, any favorite up-and-coming Canadian musicians? I'm absolutely crazy for July Talk. Nice. That's about July Talk. Yeah, I really like them. I think I think they're an incredible band. I think they're going to be headlining big summer festivals. Yeah, there are lots of people I like. I, I just saw uh, Justin Rutledge about two weeks ago, three weeks ago in Kingston. And it was phenomenal. Really good. And, you know, Daniel Romano. And I don't know. There are lots of people I like. But You've obviously decided to stay in Kingston along with many of your band members. What is it about Kingston that keeps you here? Well, it's so funny. I uh, I walked this street that I live on. I walked it every day of my life. My public school is one block to the west, and my high school is three blocks to the east, and my university is five blocks. And I walked this street every day saying, God, I got to get out of this city. I can't take it any longer. <laughs> and then I kind of got out of the city and toured around you know, Europe and the States and all across Canada, back and forth. I'm quite happy living here. Do you get approached a lot here, or are you... Uh, no, not too much. Really... Uh, you know, I'll be walking down Princess Street, and a homeless guy will say, Hey, you put on a few pounds, eh? <laughs> Comforting. <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know... I, oh, I did have one more, I, actually. I Sorry. What's your favorite song to play live? I don't have one favorite song to play live. I like the ones that you really get a crowd reaction from. And there's always a moment where the band shifts from sort of first gear into third gear in a blow it high dough when the song drops in. And there's always a moment where the whole audience starts to pogo. And I always love that. I always love playing Ahead by a Century just because, uh, I don't know, the song had a special sort of a birth. Yeah, it just, it. It's one of those songs that I think it was Paul's original idea, and it was much more of a sort of country folky song and probably wasn't going to be on the record, but everyone thought the lyrics were good and that it was a good, solid idea. Johnny and I stayed late at the studio one night hammering at it, and Johnny had an idea for a Lynn drum thing, and then starting on a small kit and switching to a big kit partway through the song, and, and I had this open tuned guitar part so everyone was sort of pouring what they bring to the table into this song and it just lifted the song up to another level so uh, yeah something about that i really feel like that's a, a full band composition and those those things like grace too is another one that it's just because it was such an had a, such an organic birth it feels like one of those songs that is very much of the five of us you've all got a stamp on it yeah Thank you so much for the interview. I really appreciate it. Oh, for it was having my pleasure. Me to your home. It was my pleasure.